my dad uh, phoned me today, and he says, son, I want you to have that motorcycle. He changed his mind. And here's the thing is, he saw his selfishness. And it says the goodness of God brings a person to repentance. You see, it's not the end of the story when you go through something and things go sideways and they look like they're not going the way you think they should. You see, we've got this idea in our mind how God should do things. Well, God's bigger than that. There's a Jewish expression, you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> and so, uh, but that's not the end of the story. So anyways, Brian was in that English class that he wouldn't talk to me that Dave was in. And the, the English teacher loved Brian because he was so rebellious. And this English teacher hated Christians. And, he, and so anyways, he's teaching how to do an essay, and you have to do it in a certain way, and you got to do it. It's like, and he's trying to think of an illustration, it's like buying a motorcycle. All of a sudden, that illustration came to his mind, and he went over to Brian. Brian, tell us how you bought the motorcycle. He didn't know Brian was a Christian. And Brian says, sir, you don't want to know. <laughs> you don't want to know. You really don't, you really don't want to know. <laughs> go, Brian, go. And Brian... Uh, and so, and then the, the teacher said, now I really want to hear yeah. the story. You were there, so you can confirm yeah, yeah. this. I wasn't there. So um, anyways, sir, I prayed about it. And he ended him telling the whole story about how God had brought them. I think that the guy turned white. <laughs> the whole class was silent. <laughs> because they didn't know Brian had become a Christian. And they knew Brian's other side, the pre-Christian yeah. side, which God was working on and uh, sanctifying him. <laughs> And anyways, um, so Brian got the motorcycle. He even got it for a better deal. And uh, fast forward years, just maybe 10 years ago, Brian's sex successful engineer family, living for the Lord. He lives in Southern California, just doing so well. Oh, praise God. But his father's dying. So he comes home, and his dad's got a few weeks left to live. He's got cancer. And his dad doesn't know the Lord. And so I'm at the hospital with Brian, with another friend, and I said to his dad, I said, did you, I said, you were part of a miracle that you may not have, his dad never knew the story, never knew the other side of the story. And I said, Mr. Stiness, I said, do you realize you were part of a miracle? And he said, no. And I shared the story that he had never heard about Brian praying for it and God changing his heart. And his dad accepted the Lord and then died shortly afterwards. <laughs> I want to tell you something. It's never about anything but Jesus. It's not about us getting stuff. It's not about us having a fulfilled life. It's about glorifying God in everything we do. And we can take things like motorcycles and dog walks yeah. <laughs> and going to, I was just, we were just, my wife and I were just recently at a, a pet food store. And we've been buying, you know, we've been buying these uh, dog treats yeah, for yeah, this dog yeah. that's destroying our house. <laughs> and uh, anyways, uh, she's a puppy. She's cute. We'll keep her. Um, but you have to buy chewy things. And so I saw this, this young girl owns this pet food store. And I saw her a year ago and she was on crutches and, and she was in a lot of pain. And I just said to her, all I said to her is, I'll be praying for you. And that's all. I didn't add to it. I didn't try and convince her. See, here's the thing. You don't have to convince people. You carry the presence. You carry the presence. If you're a believer in Jesus, Jesus goes with you. So I just invite him with me everywhere I go. I do. And I'll have a conversation this way, but I'm having a conversation this way at the same time. So, um, and, my, and then a year later we go back, and she said to me, my wife and I were together, she said, uh, would you do me a favor? I have a customer whose little boy's got cancer. Would you pray for him? She picked up on that. And I said, yes, we'll pray for him. I said, do you mind if I explain to you what it means to have a relationship with God? She says, I was thinking last night, I wanted to ask you that. And you came in today. And I said, are you okay with this? I don't like pushy evangelism. I don't think we have to strong old people. We don't have to twist her arms. We don't have to convince them. She said, I asked you. She was telling me <laughs> off. Okay, I get Twist it. my arm. I'm okay, good. I'll I'm tell good. you. <laughs> anyway, so the beautiful thing was right there. I shared with her that none of us are good enough that Jesus did for us what we could not do. It's by his grace, not by our works, that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead. But you must choose to accept him into your heart. You have to ask him to forgive you and surrender your life. You don't earn salvation, but you receive it by faith. Would you like to do that? And I said, please don't do it. If you don't want to, you don't believe it, or you're not ready. It's okay. There's no push or shove. This is about love. I want you to know God loves you, and he is right here, and he's waiting. But 
love by its very nature cannot demand. And she says, I want to do it. And right there, my wife and I prayed with her. And it was a good thing. It was the only time nobody else was in the store. It was just amazing. See, God's so timing good. is perfect. So those are, that's living, out, that's living life in the spirit. It's not some mystical thing. It's practical and it's real and it's boots on the ground. So God used this story with Brian and, and, and we just, so it was good. always about what God was yeah, going to do with his dad's life. Yeah. Let me put up a prayer for you and you can actually get into a message. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for my dear friend. Mm-hmm. Use your holy word with power and fill Harvey with your Holy Spirit to say the things that we need to hear in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Um, how much time should I put on here? Uh, the only reason I say that is once at a church, 35, 35 I, are minutes. you sure still it's not yeah, too oh long? Yeah, okay, I, got, I have to set a timer. I do. Sorry. Um, <laughs> there we go. No, I mean it. Uh, what are you laughing at? <laughs> Yeah, they once told me to preach the everlasting gospel, and I kind of took them literally and had to shut me down. So, you know. Uh, First of all, congratulations both to Dave and Helen, your amazing team, uh, for 25 years. For me, it's 40, six and a half years knowing Dave. So I've been his ministry project for all this time. And uh, I'm so grateful for friendship. Uh, Met my wife at his wedding, and Helen, of course, they got married. Um, (laughs) Yeah, it was good. Uh, she caught the bouquet. And I was just standing there kind of trying to mind my own business. I say, oh, you're the next lucky one. She says, with my luck, I'll probably never find a man. I say, listen, don't wait, to, you, don't wait just to find any guy. Wait for the best one. And I wasn't speaking to myself. I wasn't that arrogant. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, th- I might have been more prophetic than anything, but, um, but I wasn't thinking to myself. But I'm so grateful for my wonderful... I've got my wife, our friends, some family here. Thank you for all coming. So, guys, do you mind just standing up so people can give you a little hand? Come on. My family. I love my family. All of them, they're wonderful and and friends, so a big thanks to you. I have to tell you, though, I've never used that. You can only use that line once, especially if you married the person. You know, you don't don't use that line, wait for the best one. Someone says, I hope I find the right person. I say, I hope you do, too. It's not my problem anymore, honestly. Like, it's like, (laughs) I used it once. I'm married. We're good. I'm not going to say that again. Okay. I want to talk, just briefly, um, about two things. We're celebrating 25 years of Church on the Rock. And uh, so two things I want you to take away. Two simple thoughts. The first one is, time is short. 25 years has gone by very, very quickly. And the second thing is, what you build your life on. I love the name Church on the Rock. It's a play on words, obviously, because Hamilton's the rock, and this is the church on the rock, but it's not about the church on Hamilton. It's the church on Jesus Christ, and he is the rock. And uh, so I want to talk about these two things. First, I want to talk about the brevity of life. Uh, I remember hearing it says that time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana. You know, (laughs) time is short. (laughs) And... uh, I remember when I was a child, older people talked about how quickly time passed. And I thought, that's the way old people talk. I must be old because I'm always thinking about life is just flying by. We have, we have six grandkids now and life is just going. And you want to value what you do. It's not to get you depressed. It's to make you think, what do I value? Um, there are various ways we can respond to the brevity of life. The one is we can live for the moment. A lot of people just live for the moment. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. Or as I've seen on t-shirts, for tomorrow we shall die it. Um, you know, life is short. Uh, living uh, for this world is temporary. You know, it's, someone said it's like a roll of toilet paper. The quicker you get to the end, the faster it goes. You know, like life is, life is really short. James 4, 13 to 15, he says this. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we shall go into such and such a town and spend a a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So people live for the moment. They live for material things. I mean, what is our life? Uh, some people live for this world. This is what John says, 1 John 2, 15 to 17. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, 
the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes, and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Everything you own, every person you know, everything will pass away. As Dave so, said it so well earlier, it's all going to be ending up in the garbage heap. Is that what your life is about? So the things that are so attractive, they're so temporary. Uh, Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not lay up for yourselves tre treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where the thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Life is temporary and what we live for. Now, we need these things. We need these things. We need to live and be practical. But our purpose, our value lies in God. Last thing, we can be depressed. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanities. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Ecclesiastes 1, 2 to 3. That's really the description of a midlife crisis. And if you, if you get there long enough, you realize at some point in your life, you realize half your life has passed, half is ahead of you, and you realize, have you really accomplished? What has your life counted for? What is the meaning and purpose of your life? And it produces a crisis in many people. But what we want to do is we want to live with an eternal perspective, God's perspective. That's the perspective that we as believers in Jesus want to embrace Psalm 91 through 4 says this, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are as but yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. And then Moses goes on to say later in the psalm, says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we might apply wisdom to our hearts. You see, the brevity of life and its purpose is to retool and refocus and say, what are the really important things? What are the things that matter? How God wants to use your life to do something that has an eternal significance beyond the temporary. Jesus said this, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Matthew 6, 20. And that's what we want to do. This morning I want to think about, wow, 25 years passed and congratulations, Dave. But the big picture is we are building things for eternity. We are building our lives on the rock Christ Jesus. Matthew 7, 24 to 27 is quoted earlier. It says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So Jesus is giving us an opportunity to build on the rock. It's really on himself. He is the rock. And we'll take a look in uh, just a few moments at Matthew chapter 16, 13 to 18. But we have an opportunity to use our lives to build something significant. And it won't be building a legacy for ourselves or monument. Some people build things after their own name, but all those things are wood, hay, and stubble. Who's going to remember our name in three generations or four generations? My grandkids will know me but will my great-grandkids know me? Do you know the name of your great-grandfather or great-great-grandfather? Do you know anything about him? You don't. Because the things that last, we take to heaven. The thing that lasts is what we do for Christ. Now, I just want to have a little thing here. This is not going back under the law and self-effort. I don't want you to be under. There's no condemnation. This is a grace message. But what we build our lives on is not our performance. It's on our relationship. It's not, do you know that if you surrender your life to Christ, like we prayed and had that wonderful opportunity to see that young woman receive Christ. But had we gone in there 
and she had said no when I invited her to receive Jesus, it would not have made no difference in terms of our eternal impact for us because what God is looking for is faithfulness. See, we are people who live by the Spirit. We're not under the law. It's under grace. So what lasts for God is not like performance-based acceptance. There is no performance-based acceptance in the kingdom. It's Jesus Christ crucified and raised from the dead plus nothing. Isn't that good news this morning? You are completely loved, completely accepted because of who Jesus is and what he's done and our faith in him. But what is important is that we abide in him. And that means we just continually allow God to use us. It's like when we're in the grocery store and we have an opportunity to bless someone that day. I remember this is a true story. A friend of mine said, a friend of his, she was a woman in the church. She was fairly poor, but one of the things that was on her heart was to feed the hungry. So every week what she did for the church was she bought cans of food and took them to the church um, stockhouse and, and put the, the food in there. And she, she had a heart for the poor. One week she couldn't go to church, so she prayed, she says, Lord, today, if you show me someone who is in need, I will buy the food and give it to them. Because that was what God had put on her heart. See, she's wired in a certain way. You're all wired differently. We can't, we're not like each other. And so God had used her and gave her this heart for the poor. Anyway, she's in the grocery store and she sees a man looking at cans and looking at the price and putting it back. She made a mental note. She put those cans in her food basket and she prayed, says, God, if you want me to give, to buy this food for this man, would you have him come behind me? And guess what? She's up. She's ready to pay for the Guess who's standing behind her in the grocery line? And while she's there, she just builds the courage, says, sir, I know you don't know me. And she shares the story about how, what she does for her church and how she prayed that God would show her someone in need. And she says, I hope you don't mind, but I would like to buy this food for you. I was praying. I prayed that you would come behind me. Can you imagine that? She, rem she says, oh, I just forgot something. I'll be right back. And when she came back, the man was in tears. And she said, he said to her, Ma'am, you don't know it, but I'm a backslidden Christian. Someone said to me this week, God is going to show you that he loves you. And he said, I will be returning to the Lord. Our lives matter to God. It's not looking for the big things. Even a cup of cold water in the name of the disciple, you will no wise lose your reward. But it's the spirit in with which we do it. We do it out of love for God. It's not the result that's the important thing. You know, uh, I always, you know, I've had the privilege of praying with many people to receive Christ. But do you know how many people I have actually led to Christ? None. Because that's the Spirit's job. That's not my job. I have never saved a person because I didn't die for their sins and I didn't rise from the dead, but Christ did. And it's about Him. Our job is not to save people. That's His job. Our job is just to be faithful. If they come to Christ, I rejoice because that's important. If someone else leads a person to Christ, I rejoice just as much because it's not about me, it's about him. But we have the privilege of allowing the Spirit to use us. Like the lady in line, it doesn't have to be big things. It's about daily walking and obeying and abiding in Jesus. That is what has an eternal reward. That is what is going to have a foundation that will last forever. Uh, everything that is not built on Christ will not stand. Listen to what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. According to the grace God has given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw... Each one's work will become manifest, but the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward, singular. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but it is only as through fire. So let's be clear here. Uh, you will not be judged. Do you know that you have passed? If you know Jesus Christ, you've passed from death to life. All the sins that you have committed are on the cross. You are completely forgiven past, present, and future. Isn't that good news? But what will be judged is your works. So the works will be judged, and anything that did not glorify God, anything not done through the Spirit, will be burned up. And that's God's goodness, by the way. 
You know why? Because there'll be no shame in eternity. You will not be bringing shame. But don't you want to present something to God? Don't you want to be able to take those crowns and lay them at his feet and say, it was all you, Jesus, anyways? That's what we take into eternity. We don't know what it looks like, but I remember the story of a man, and he was a very wealthy man, and he built, uh, had a house built by one of his best friends. And he said, would you build me this house? And it was a beautiful home. But the friend was thinking, ah, you know, he has lots of money, so he used inferior products. The windows weren't as good. There was corners cut. When you look at the house, it looked like a good house. But he knew it wasn't quite what it should be. But he said that the insulation was a little thin and the, you know, it wasn't quite square. But it, it, he'd finished building the house. And when he finished building the house and the man paid for the house, the man turned around and said, here's the keys to the house. I'm giving it to you as a wedding gift. That's why you reap what you sow. The things that you invest in, where your heart is, there's your treasure. This is not a beat you up message. It's a message, you can do it. You can do this. You can do this. You can really do this. You can live by the Spirit because God says you can. Paul said it this way, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you might be looking at yourself, but I have all these weaknesses and problems and I just, I just, I'm overcome. God will give you the grace to walk with him if you really surrender. That's what faith is. It's those things built on Christ through faith in him. It's our daily walk. As you've received Christ, so walk in him. How did you receive Christ? You received Christ by faith. Well, that's how we continue on. I remember uh, my wife and I have run Alphas for many years. Our first Alpha, September 13th, 1999. I said, honey, do you mind if we do an Alpha that summer? I said, I got some people I'd come, maybe have half a dozen people. She said, that'd be great. We had 40 people the first week at our Alpha. After that alpha, my wife said, I'm sending out 12 plates. You can invite who you like. <laughs> um, I became an alphaholic. I, uh, I just love seeing people come to Jesus. I just do. Derek, you were with us in that first alpha. My kids were with us. People in this room were at our first alpha. There's a man there. His wife had worked in our office. He was 75 years old. He was given a few months to live because he had um, prostate cancer that had spread to the bones. And he was 75. He was... Uh, the um, chief executive officer of Johnson & Johnson in the Caribbean from Jamaica. For all of the West Indies, he was the top man for Johnson & Johnson. He had retired, they moved back to Canada, his wife worked in her office, and he was very, as he said, worldly man. He loved, he was personal friends of the Prime Minister of Jamaica when he was younger. He was well known, he was, as they say in Jamaica, uptown. And uh, so he decided to come. He only came because his wife invited him to come. He said, well, it's, you know, I, sh I should come. I, these talks on religion are boring. By the third week, he fell in love with Jesus and he got born again. And let me tell you what he said, which was very, very telling. He became born again. He says, I feel like an old man that's fallen in love all over again. He loved Jesus, but he says, I don't have, we went out for lunch. He'd received the Lord. And he said, uh, I don't have very much time to live. And he said, I'm 75. And he says, I regret the years that I could have known Jesus. I lived a great life. I, I flew among the highest. And all that means nothing now that my life is so short. That's what he said. He lived till he was 94 and he led tons of people to Jesus. <laughs> my point is this. Don't determine how long you're going to live. It's not in your hands. Determine, as Paul says, forget those things that are behind and press on. Do not live in regret. Do not. Because whatever's happened, happened. But God can redeem those things. What does he say in the book of Joel? God will take the years the locust has eaten. Those years of regret, those years of waste, those years of selfishness, those years of barrenness. And he can redeem it and make it something beautiful. And that's what God wants to do in your life. I had a, a friend when I was in high school, well, an acquaintance. My brother picked him up. My brother was an engineer and he was driving to Grand Bend to inspect a building and he picks up this young hitchhiker and he has this feeling that he's supposed to witness to him but he didn't know how to bring it up so he didn't say anything. And, uh, and he said, God, forgive me. If you give me another chance, I will share the gospel with him. Guess who was hitching, I, hitchhiking on the way back? Same guy. This guy was 17, 18 years old. So Howard shared the gospel with him. He said, oh, I know about the gospel. And he says, I've been to some churches but you know, I want to live life for myself. Maybe when I'm old, 
I will accept Jesus. But right now, I want to party. I want to do the things that I want to do. I don't want to, I don't want to surrender my life to Christ. I want to live my way. And that's really what we're talking about. It's about surrender. Anyways, two weeks later, he was killed in a car accident. God had given him a chance. See, uh, Reinhard Bonnke, the late Reinhard Bonnke, used to say this, eternity is not something in front of you, it's something that runs parallel beside you, and at any point, you can step over into eternity. And we need to be ready. We need to be ready. We need to give our lives and determine whatever's happened in the past, we can surrender now. Whether you're a Christian say, I'm really determined to walk, I just want a relationship with Jesus. It just, it's not complicated. We make it complicated. It's not about attaining some high spiritual level. It's about being surrendered, saying, every day is yours, God. I just want to trust you. If you give me an opportunity. You know, I uh, pray when people come to my home to fix stuff, because I'm not good. I don't know, how much time do I have? Oh, good. I got a few minutes. <laughs> or maybe you're saying, oh, bad. Could you hurry up and get rid of it? <laughs> I'm, I'm convinced there's a, and please don't take this in a bad way. You know I'm Jewish. Uh, I don't know if you know a lot of Jewish plumbers. I actually don't. I do. I am not gifted. I'm, I'm convinced I have a genetic defect when it comes to fixing stuff. <laughs> I'm convinced of it. Now, my brother's Jewish. He was Jewish. He could fix stuff. So it's not completely true. And I'm not trying to stereotype it. Although I did hear a Jewish comedian one time say that a Jewish shop class was a bunch of Jewish boys on the phone getting quotes. You know, that would be me. That would be me. I just can't fix anything. I mean, you know, you hear about a Jewish lawyer and a Jewish doctor. You don't hear about Jewish plant, nothing. I wish I was, I wish I was good with my hands. I've just not. When we first bought our first house, I said, look, I got this little toilet handle. It's nothing. I'm going to be the man of the house. We've got a house. I'm going to fix it. You know the most dreaded words in our house are? Some assembly required. That's the most <laughs> dreaded language in our house. Anyway, so I went to, it was one in the afternoon. I remember it was a Saturday. I bought a little handle, but then the other part broke. I ended up. 11 hours later, going to the last hardware store, I replaced every part in the toilet, and guess what? The thing leaked like a sieve. I had to turn off the water, not to the toilet, to the whole house, because it didn't have a turn off on the toilet. I had to phone a plumber the next day, to, and, and the guy said, he laughed, thank you. Uh, he said, at least you tried. And I said, that's the last time I tried. I know my gifts, that's not one of them. So I'm just being very vulnerable. But do you know that God can use your weaknesses? Do you know that God can use your weaknesses? So next day, so that, now, fast forward to three months ago. I have a plumbing contract. Very proud of myself. <laughs> and so guess what? I had a problem with my toilets, two of them. So I phoned the company, and they sent whoever's there. And this guy came, and we will uh, call him, uh, I don't want to use his real name. Uh, let's call him, um, what are we going to call him? <laughs> Muhammad. That wasn't his name. But he was obviously from a non-Christian background from the Middle East. And I remember, and I prayed for him. I said, Lord, if you have something to say to this man, if you have something to say to this man, then, then I want to be available. And I try to pray that for everybody. Most of the time they come in, they fix the thing, and they leave. But at least I pray. See, that's walking in relationship with Jesus because you don't know. So we do our part, and that's just trusting Jesus and praying and surrendering. I don't know how it's going to unfold. And then this guy comes. And he notices our pictures of Israel, and I, he asked me if I was Israeli. I said, no, I'm, I'm actually not Israeli. My sons-in-law are, but I'm Jewish. And he says to me, uh, do you have to become, like, can you become Jewish, or are you, do you have to be born Jewish? And I said, well, actually, I'm, you have to be born Jewish. Some people can convert, not so many do. I said, but actually, I became a Christian, and I'm a pastor of a church. And he tells me the story that he, when he came to Canada from the Middle East, he was raised in a non-Christian home and obviously, and a Muslim home. And uh, he came with a lot of depression. He said, the psychiatrist said, can I pray for you? And he said, what do you want to pray for me? That doesn't work. And she said, let me pray for you. So, so he told me this, she prayed for me in the name of Jesus and the depression completely and instantly lifted from him. And I said to him, Jesus is real. I said, Jesus is real. He, he died for our sins and he was raised from the dead. I said, can I give you a gift? I said, and please don't take it if you don't want to take it. I'm not pushing anything on you. He says, I would like to, I want to give you a Bible. So he came in, I gave him a Bible, and I opened up to John 3, 16, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, and Romans 10, where it says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus uh, is raised from the dead, that he is Lord, that you will be saved. And I said to him, you don't have to do this, but would you like to receive Jesus? And he says, I would. And right there he prayed 
to receive the Lord. We don't know who God's bringing into our lives or what people observe about us. But we do know this, the things that are done in the Spirit are eternal. The results are not your business. That's God's business. Whether he received Christ or not was between him and God, and he, he did pray to receive the Lord. But what God, what God does through you is his business. What God does in you is your business. And what God does in us is based on us surrendering and saying, I want to do, I delight to do your will, O oh God. And I want to tell you, it's a delight. And those are the things, building the church on the rock, as it says in Matthew chapter uh, 16. I'll just read this one verse. I had a whole other thing. Um, now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I will tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples that he would tell no one that he was the Christ. Wow. Jesus' self-disclosure of himself that he, on this rock. See, he was a play on words. Peter means little rock. But Petra means big rock. And on this rock, on Christ Jesus, that's what we build our lives on. And it comes only by revelation. You can't force the revelation of Jesus on anyone else. But if you get a revelation, that's what is immovable. That is what is unshakable. And that is eternal. The place where Jesus took his disciples in the regions of Philippi, Philippi Caesarea, is now called the Banyas up in northern Israel. And it was the capital of paganism. Did you know that? They used to worship the god Pan there. When they say Banyas, they really mean Panyas, but they, there was no P in that language. And so they used to worship the universal god of paganism. And he says, on this rock, the god Pan was a shepherd god, half goat and half human. He used to play the Pan flute. And it used to throw rocks down on people. And it was a very capricious god. And people were very afraid of the god Pan. And you go in the regions, and there's still the niches there where they, the temple of worshiping god Pan was there. And rocks would come down, and the, and the shepherds would think that this god was dangerous and angry, and you had to appease the god. And he'd throw rocks down, and that's where they, and they call the fear of Pan, Panakeon. That's where we get our word panic from. But Jesus says, in contrasting to that god, the God that causes fear, which is Satan, the one that puts you in bondage through fear. Fear is bondage. We've got the God of love, and you can build on the God of love because of who Jesus Christ is. And the reason he said, don't tell anyone yet, because the cross hadn't happened, the resurrection hadn't happened, but we can tell everybody now. Because that's the solid rock of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. It's not about us and our works. It's not about us looking good. It's not even about us fulfilling our destiny. It's about loving Jesus and walking in relation with Jesus. And when we walk with him daily, we choose to take up our cross, and that means we, we don't do the things that we want to do in ourselves. We do what he wants us to do. That is eternal. That can never be shaken. And that's what God is inviting us all into. If you've never received Jesus... If you can't remember you received Jesus, you can receive Jesus just like the people I shared with you. If you really mean business with God, he will meet you in that place. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how much you failed. I don't care who you are. The love of God is compelling us. It's an invitation. It's not an ultimate. I'm not here to beat you up. I'm not here to shame you. I'm here to encourage you. You can know Jesus. You can receive him. Three things you have to do. You have to admit that you're not good enough. The old-fashioned word sinner kind of makes us feel bad about ourselves. It just means we're human. We're not perfect. Is that okay? Are we all human here? Are we all imperfect? Now, some of us are a little more imperfect than others, not going to lie. <laughs> Don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> but we all need, we all are, we're all needy. We can't save ourselves. Your good works will not save you. It's so clear. We're not saved by good works. We're saved for good works. Second thing is we Believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. Now, you're almost there. If you know that you're not good enough and that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead, the perfect Son of God. But there's a third thing. It has to drop from here to here, not by surrender, where we say to God, yes, 
I, I receive you. I believe in you. Believe is not just a head thing. It's opening your heart and saying, I'm going to go your way. See, it's not my way or your way, but Yahweh. <laughs> and we want to, yeah, you like that one. I like it too, yeah. <laughs> we want to surrender, and that comes by an invitation. Do you want to receive an invitation? you mind if I pray? There might be someone here that has never received Jesus, and you can do it by, but don't receive, don't pray the prayer if you don't want to. You don't believe it or you're not ready. There's no push or shove. This is about love. And love never imposes itself. So we're not here to impose on you. We're here to embrace you, to invite you. And I'm sure that the prayer team would love to pray with you as well. But I'm going to pray a prayer. You can join me in prayer if, if you're ready. Hey, 17 seconds. That's good. Uh, <laughs> talk about being saved by the bell. <laughs> well, actually, we're saved by Jesus, but that does ring a bell. Anyways, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Pray this prayer with me in your heart. You don't need to raise your hand to come forward, but pray, pray this prayer with me in your heart. Dear God, I know I'm not good enough. I know that I need Jesus Christ. I thank you that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, for me personally. He shed his blood for me, that my sins could be washed away, and he was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit. And I ask now that you'll forgive all my sins. I surrender my life. I, know, I believe in you, but I want to live life your way. I don't want to live life independent of you anymore. I want a relationship with you. Please come into my heart. Forgive my sins, for I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Congratulations, Dave and Helen and, and the Church on the Rock for 25 years. Love you all. God bless.